the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a story of the West with Lorne Green as your host. Here's a preview. Did he ever actually shoot anyone? Well, that's the story. After a while, folks just began to steer clear of both of them. Well, why Jubal? Well, because they were identical twins. You could never be sure which one you were confronted with till he opened his mouth. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Lorne Green. The town of Commodore's Gap sits on the rolling prairie in the Wyoming Territory. It's nestled in an elbow of the Platte River, just to the east of the Rocky Mountains. It's like any other frontier town in most respects, except for one curious feature. Just beyond the town limit stands a remarkable-looking house, three stories high, built in the Victorian style, with a mansard roof, a tower, and a good deal of gingerbread trim. It seems as much out of place now as it did when it was built after the Civil War by Commodore August Milburn, late of the United States Navy, who, for reasons of his own, decided he wanted to settle as far away from water as he possibly could. He lived there only a few years before a hunting accident cut short his life. Two years later, a young man named Jubal Silito came to town and inquired after the house. He was told no provision had been made for its disposal, and whoever wanted the work of keeping it up could have it. Jubal moved in. But unfortunately, he was not alone. He had a twin brother, Jediah, who was as mean-spirited as Jubal was kind. Neither brother did much to fix the place up, but Jubal did tend the orchard and plant a small garden. And folks liked him as much as they disliked Jediah. So when it happened... They were stunned in disbelief and terror. And that's only the beginning of our story. A new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Punishment and Crime by Percy Granger. Our stars, Parley Bear and Howard Culver. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. on the verge of statehood. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad has opened the West to development unparalleled in modern times. But progress always occurs at the expense of history. And even so slight a town as Commodore's Gap has a history. Or I should say, a memory or two it would be more than happy to have drowned out by the shrill of a locomotive's whistle. The year is 1890. We're in the office of the mayor, Edward T-Bone Pettigrew. He's entertaining a very important visitor. Now, the main railroad line runs 15 miles to the north. Our surveyors have laid out a proposed branch line into Commodore's Gap, which I'll show you on the map. Wait down that end, would you? Yeah, surely. Now, uh, here's the Colon station on the main line at Elmore Springs. We lay track from that point south along the Platte River and build a station here. Uh, that looks pretty good to me, Mr. Peters. This, of course is assuming that you can guarantee us the freight business we discussed yesterday. I sure can. Uh, do you have any reservations about our proposed route? Nope. What about that house? What house? Or just north of town, that old mansion. It's sitting right where we want to lay track. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you can tear it down. Well, you have to negotiate to the owners, I suppose. There aren't any. Not anymore. It's deserted? It has been for several years. And I think folks around here will be more than grateful if your men destroy all trace that it ever existed. Oh? Now, why is that? The last folks to live there were a couple of brothers named Silito, Jubal and Jediah Silito. You ever hear of them? Never did. No. Then you ain't been around these parts long. What happened there is one of the most grisly tales you'd ever want to hear. Makes some of them Indian raids seem like something out of Bill Cody's Wild West show. The house itself was built after the Civil War by Commodore Milburn. Oh, is that how Commodore's Gap got its name? Yep. He made a small fortune running a ferry service across the Platte River. Anyway, the Commodore died. 
and his wife went back east and was never heard from again. A few years later, these two brothers come out of nowhere and took the homesteading on the property. No one minded much at first, because Jubal was a pretty nice fellow. Personally, I always thought he was a little feeble in the head, but he was harmless, and the local kids took a real shine to him. He never came into town, but what he'd bring some apples from his orchard or buy him some candy. But Jediah, hmm, that was another story. Jediah was mean as a buzzsaw, the devil himself, if you believe in such things. He was a recluse, and no one ever saw him much, unless you got too close to their house. And then? He'd threaten to kill you, chase you off with a shotgun. Ah. Did he ever actually shoot anyone? Well, that's the story. After a while, folks just began to steer clear of both of them. Well, why Jubal? Well, because they were identical twins. You could never be sure which one you were confronted with till he opened his mouth. Identical twins and different as day and night. <laughs> that must have been hard on Jubal. Yes, I felt sorry for him. It was pretty clear his brother's meanness embarrassed him, but I never once heard him say a word against Jediah, or against anybody else for that matter. I don't think he could have been cruel if he tried. I don't even think he really understood what cruelty was. Sounds feeble-minded, if you ask me. Now, how long did they live out there? Oh, nine hundred fifteen and fifteen years. And then what happened? Well, sir, the whole gruesome story began to come to light one day about four years ago. I was a sheriff then, and my deputy was out riding the river scouting for traces of a party of rustlers who'd been highly active in the neighborhood. He came to the rusting barbed wire fence that surrounded the Silito's property there. Land stretched down to the river, you see. And he cut inland. He didn't want any truck with Jediah and figured no rustlers would either. As he approached the main road, he saw some up against the fence ahead of him there. From a distance, it looked like a bundle of rags somebody had thrown over the sagging wire, but when he got closer, he saw it was a man. The man was dead? Yep. Shot from behind. The force of the shotgun blast had hurled him against the barbed wire. He was killed by a shotgun. That's right. The same kind of gun that was owned by Jediah. <laughs> to town, Commodore's Gap is finally going on the map. Its future, like that of all America at the time, seems unlimited. But the future is built on the past, and the past must often be exorcised. Perhaps that's what the mayor of Commodore's Gap, Edward Pettigrew, is doing as he continues his story. Well, as I say, I was the sheriff at the time. And the body was discovered by my deputy, Jim Prescott. There he is, Sheriff. Good golly. That's how you found him? Thrown up against the barbed wire like that? I ain't touched him. I come got you first thing. Half his back is blown away. Like he was trying to run. Looks to me like a shotgun blast. Yeah. Let's get him untangled. Have a look at his face. Have you ever seen him before? Oh. Judge, but these old bulls he's wearing, he looks like a tramp. Uh, check his pants pockets. See if there's anything that'll identify him. I'll check his coat. If you ask me, it's pretty obvious what happened. Old Jediah finally scratched the itch on his trigger finger. What'd you find? A few dollars, a bit of string, nothing more. <laughs> Look at here. What's that? An old photograph. A woman. Looks to be middle-aged. Not very good looking. Well, I've known men to carry worse. You didn't hear anything, did you, or see anyone? Nope. But in this cool weather, he could have been dead a couple of days. Well, you better get back to town, bring out a tarp and a buckboard. Where are you going? To have a talk with Jediah Silito. I rode the quarter of a mile or so along the river till I came inside of the house. The whole business made me uneasy right from the start. I kept trying to reassure myself as I approached that Jediah wasn't going to shoot me, too. I had this nervous feeling I was being watched. And I'll admit I was relieved when it was Jubal who answered the door. When I told him what had happened, he was stunned. The man was murdered? Shot in the back. From the size of the wound, I'd say at fairly close range. 
He, he was on our land. Uh, by your north fence. This is terrible. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. You, who was he? I don't know. I'd like to have a word with Jediah. Oh, Sheriff, you don't think... No, you don't really think Jed could have done such a thing. Where is he? He's upstairs, but he's asleep. In the middle of the day? He hasn't been feeling well. In fact, he hasn't been out of bed for nearly a week. You sure of that? Well, I haven't been at his bedside 24 hours, but I'm sure I would have heard him. Mind if I go up? Well, no, but I wouldn't advise it. He's very sick. I'm afraid he has scarlet fever. Scarlet fever? Has Doc Hansen been out to see him? No. You know he wouldn't come, Sheriff. But, but I can take care of him. That's pretty dangerous. I know. I'm very worried about him. I meant for you, Jubal. Oh, I'll be all right. In a day or two, perhaps, if I'm able to bring fever down, you can talk to him. Well, I sure don't want to go catching scarlet fever out of all this. Uh, where'd you keep your shotgun? Here, in the parlor. Let me see it. Mm -hmm. Looks to me like it's been fired recently. He went hunting across the river about a week ago, just before he took sick. A week? Well, I don't think the body's been out there that long. You have no idea who the poor man was? Nope. All we found on him was this picture. Oh. You recognize her? No. Well, it probably doesn't matter who she is or who he was either. Uh, I'm taking the shotgun with me, Jubal. And I'll be back day after tomorrow to talk to Jediah. So you left the house without talking to him? Yep. How'd you know Jediah was sick at all? How'd you know Jubal just wasn't covering his escape? I didn't. I trusted him. I could have saved myself a lot of trouble if I hadn't. And then I might never have gotten to the bottom of the whole story either. So what'd you do? Wait the two days and go back? No. Something was bothering me. I, I kept saying that the identity of the dead man didn't matter, but I realized the more I said it, the less I believed it. Now, if he was just a tramp, what would it matter? I kept looking at that photograph. Of the middle-aged woman? The expression on her face just wouldn't let me alone. The eyes burned with the heat of a visionary prepared to show no mercy to the infidel. The photographer's hallmark was stamped on the cardboard matting, and it was from a studio in Laramie. There wasn't much to go on, and I kept telling myself it wouldn't lead to anything anyway. I could have discharged my duties in the affair by just digging a hole and rolling the dead man in, but something about the whole business just wouldn't let me alone. I rode up to the coaling station at Elmore Springs and flagged down the eastbound train that same afternoon. By evening, I was in Laramie. It was a long shot. The photograph was obviously old, and it was likely the man that took it was no longer in business. But I was in luck. The fellow was still there. Hello? Uh, uh you Mr. Lombarda? Yes, but I'm sorry. We're closed for the day. Well, this won't take but a minute. Oh, no. All my equipment is put away for the night. Uh, my name is Ed Pettigrew. I'm the sheriff out in Commodore's Gap. Oh? What do you want with me? I was wondering if you could identify this picture. Well, let me take it over to the lamp. Oh. Well, now this is very old. It's got your imprimatur down there at the bottom. You recognize it? Silito. What? Silito. Her name was Silito. You sure about that? Well, I remember she came into the studio with two young men. Her sons? I don't know. None of them said a word. Oh, she said she wanted a picture of herself and two copies made, but that was it. Did they live here in town? I think they did. In fact, uh, well, I, I believe she's still alive. She lives in the Angus Horn. Uh, that's a flea bag hotel over the old section of town. Oh. Was she related to them? Yep. How? And what was that tramp doing with her picture? Those were exactly my questions as I left Mr. Lombardo's studio and headed for the Angus Horn. Sheriff Edward Pettigrew's search for an explanation to the brutal murder of an old tramp is making unexpected headway. But even more unexpected are the revelations that lie ahead. Did you find the old woman? In a way. 
Well, what do you mean? Either you found her or you didn't. Oh, oh, unless she was dead. No, she wasn't dead. What was she in that ramshackle hotel, like the photographer said? Yeah. The Angus Horn had been a fine hotel once. One of the first permanent structures in Laramie. But its heyday was long past, and it was now a run-down boarding house. The desk clerk wasn't more than a half step away from being a derelict himself. When I told him I was a sheriff and who I was looking for, his jaw dropped. And he gave a kind of a amazed laugh and slapped his thigh. <laughs> By golly, I don't believe it. She's been expecting you. She has. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, has somebody else been here already? No. She's been saying for years how sooner or later some sheriff's going to come by with word. Word of what? I don't know. <laughs> she sits up in her tent. Tent? Well, you know, like a hermit in the desert waiting for God or the devil, whichever comes first. She's crazy as an old hoot owl, but by golly, if here you ain't. <laughs> so she didn't mean you in particular? Well, I guess not. But she knew to expect someone. Why? That's what I hope to find out. The clerk gave me directions to her room. Top floor all the way in the back. The building was so old, the paper was peeling, and there was dust everywhere. There wasn't any lights in the hall, and it was pitch dark. I found a room by the simple expedient that it was the only one with lights under the door. waited in the darkness a long time. There was no answer and no movement from the other side. I began to imagine things. There was a violence in the air. I could feel it. I caught myself fingering my gun. I heard sounds. I listened at the door. It was like metal objects being tapped lightly against each other. I gripped my gun tighter and carefully tried the door. It was open. The room was just about the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. I realized what the desk clerk meant about the tent. There were blankets and old faded bedspreads draped over the windows and all the walls. They were even over the ceiling. It was like something out of the Arabian Nights, except it was all dank and musty. The old woman sat in the corner. And, and the clanking you heard? Well, she was eating supper. I, I confess I felt a little foolish about that. She wasn't surprised to see you? She didn't even look up. While she finished the last few scraps of food on her plate, I surveyed the room. The only light was from a single kerosene lantern. I noticed the glass chimney was broken and the flame was burning pretty close to one of the blankets. I, I almost said something, but it didn't. Everything about the room seemed so strange and timeless. I figured that lamp had probably sat that way for years. If it hadn't caught fire before, there was no reason why it would now. Finally, she she looked up. Yes? Uh, is, is your name Silito? What, what do you want? Is your name Silito? Yes? Well, I'm Ed Pettigrew. I'm the peace officer from over to Commodore's Gap. Um... I'd like to talk to you for a moment. You're here. There's nothing to talk about. Why have you been expecting me? Who says I was? The old fellow who runs the desk downstairs. You don't want to listen to him. But you were expecting someone, a, a, a sheriff? Tell me what happened. I was kind of hoping you could tell me... Uh... Do you uh, recognize this? What is that? Well, it's an old photograph. Where'd you get that? Is that you? Might be. The photographer remembers taking it. He says it's you. How'd you come by it? Do you have two sons? Do you have two sons named Jubal and Jediah? I had... Two sons. Yes. When was the last time you saw him? I don't remember. 
but they're living not 50 miles from here in Commodore's Gap. Together? You mean you didn't know that? But they've been there 15 years. Together? They're living together? Her whole countenance changed. She rose to her feet and came towards me like she couldn't believe what I'd said. She was their mother. She asked me one question after another, hungry for news. When I allowed us how Jediah was the less well-liked of the two, she nodded vigorously, and a fanatical edge crept into her voice. Jediah was evil. Evil. Satan's blood flowed in his veins. He was a judgment on us. But Jubal was good. He was the stronger he was. He would triumph in the end. I always knew he would. Jediah's wickedness has been vanquished. The devil has to come. I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm afraid his wickedness hasn't been vanquished at all. He's killed a man. Killed a man? At least I think he has. Who? I don't know. But we found this picture on the body. You found that on the body? I don't understand. Who else would have carried your picture, Mrs. Silito? I don't know. I'm not much to look at, sir. Well, anyway, it'd be a help if you could come with me and, and see if you could recognize the dead man. There's no need. What? What's happened? Happened. <laughs> I couldn't get her to say another thing. It was like she turned into stone before my eyes. As I left the old building, I tried to make sense of it. She knew who the dead man was. I was sure of that. But something I'd told her about the murder had frightened her into silence. She'd been expecting me, too. Maybe she'd been expecting the killing as well. That tramp wasn't just a passerby. And I figured for sure now that his identity was a crucial link in the case against Jediah. Which, after all, at this point, was only circumstantial. Well, maybe the tramp was her husband, the boy's father. No, I, I thought of that, but he wasn't old enough. He wasn't more than four or five years older than Jubal and Jediah. But he had the old woman's picture in his pocket. Do you think Jediah put it there? And if he did, why? I didn't know. But I knew what my next move was. Illness or no illness, it was time to talk to Jediah and to make an arrest. Once we had a trial, we could subpoena Mrs. Silito and compel her to testify under oath. Yes? Oh, Mr. Pettigrew. Morning, Jubal. Uh, come in. Thanks. I want to see Jediah. Oh, he's still very ill. Uh, you said you'd wait a few days. I know what I said, Jubal. What I'm saying now is I want to talk to him. He, uh, he, he's asleep. He had a restless night. The fever's worse. If you could wait until he wakes up... Sorry, Joe. There's been a murder, and I aim to find out who that man was and why he was killed. I went upstairs. Jubal followed. At the landing, I asked him to point out Jediah's room. As we walked down the hall, it occurred to me that to the best of my knowledge, no outsider had ever been on the second floor of the house. Not since he moved in. And at the moment my hand fell on the door latch to Jediah's room, I felt a pang of fear. I turned quickly, but Jubal was standing with his arms at his sides with a strange kind of idiot grin on his face, as if he had ceased to comprehend what was going on. I opened the door slowly and went into the room. The blinds were drawn, it was dim. I became intensely aware that this room was even barer than the rest of the house. There was no rug, no pictures on the wall, no furniture. Just a bed. And the bed was empty. Empty? There was no one in the room. Jediah was gone. So he'd escaped. He'd never been sick at all. I'd been duped. I'd made an estimate of Jubal's character, and I'd been wrong. But he stood there looking so bewildered, a part of me still wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. 
Maybe Jediah had heard me coming. But the windows were shut. And moreover, the bed hadn't been used, at least not recently. And I had to accept the evidence. Jubal? Where is he, Jubal? I, I don't know. I was taking the best care of him I knew how. He shouldn't have gone. He's not well. You lied to me. No, no, I didn't. What about this photograph, the one we found on the body? Now, you said you'd never seen it. Well, I, I haven't. Who is she? I, I, I... It's your mother, isn't it, Jubal? I found her. She's living in Laramie. Is that your mother, Jubal, is it? What, what, what did she tell you? I lied to him. I said she told me everything, whatever that was. I thought that might break him, make him talk. But he just stared blankly at the floor, confused, lost. Oof, what did you do? I had no choice. I put him under arrest as an accessory to the murder. But then I had to face the real problem. Jediah had escaped. Somewhere, a maniacal killer was on the loose. Concluding act of punishment and crime. Once I had Jubal locked up, my next job was to find Jediah. Jubal wouldn't talk. He said nothing that made sense. He continued to act confused as if he was bewildered by what was happening. Mm, it's a safe pose under the circumstances. Well, I figured there were two possibilities. If Jediah was long gone already by the time my deputy found the body, he had a good four or five days head start, and his whereabouts were anyone's guess. And the other possibility? That he was still in the house when I'd gone there the first time. Now, if that was true, he'd know I'd found the photograph of their mother on the body, and he could figure I'd probably try to track her down. And he might make an effort to get to her first to keep her from talking. Well, I could be fairly sure I'd beaten him to that particular punch. Mrs. Silito had seemed genuinely surprised to hear that her sons were living together so close by. I could be pretty sure she hadn't been visited by either one. But he could have been on his way. Exactly. I missed the eastbound train, so I made the trip back to Laramie by horse. I got there the following afternoon and went straight to the Angus Horn. That is, I went to the spot where the Angus Horn had been three days before. Of what had happened? It was burnt to the ground. Nothing left but a pile of charred rubble. I was told the fire had broken out on the same night I was there. It had spread instantly through the old timbers, and within minutes, the whole building was engulfed. And, and Mrs. Silito? She was dead. Well, did Jediah set the fire? I don't know. It was possible. Something pretty bad had happened in that family that none of them wanted to talk about. But that included the old woman, too. I remember the fear in her eyes. And I remembered the kerosene lantern with the broken chimney that was burning so close to the blankets in her room. She burnt it down. She killed herself. Uh, somehow, by my visit, I confirmed what she'd been dreading all those years. What did you do then? I went to see the federal deputy there in Laramie. An old friend by the name of Eli McCutcheon. We'd known each other for years. He'd been sheriff before he was appointed marshal. It occurred to me, if something had happened years before... Maybe he knew about it. Eli? Yeah? T-Bone, come in, come in. <laughs> what the heck brings you to town? Have a seat. Coffee? Hey, thanks. I could use a whole pot. You look tired. There. That'll wash the dust out of your throat. Thanks. Uh, we had a bit of excitement here a couple nights ago. Uh, an old hotel burned down. I know. That's why I'm here. Oh? There was a woman living there, name of Silito. Oh, yes. You knew her? I knew the story. Why, uh, what's your interest? Story? What story? It didn't involve her directly. It was her son. Jubal and Jedi? Yes. Uh, you've uh, heard about it, then? No, but they've been living out in Commodore's Gap for the past 15 years. Living together? Yeah. I don't believe it. In the old Milburn house. On friendly terms? I'd say so, yes. That's incredible. That's the same reaction I got from Mrs. Silito. Now, why is it so incredible that they should be living together? Well, we all know Jubal didn't have a malicious bone in his body, but I'd have thought even he couldn't forget what Jedi had done to him. What was that? 
Well, you got to understand, they came from a very religious family. The father was a fire and brimstone preacher, and the mother, the one who burned in a hotel, was his chief tambourine beater. They lived and breathed the Old Testament and raised those two boys so strict, you wouldn't believe it. Well, Jediah was the black sheep, real mean. But Jubal was as Christian as a boy could be. Didn't know the meaning of evil. I'd say I'm all right. Jediah was a rebel, but Jubal was, uh, how to put it, beatific almost. He glowed. Uh, he gave off a kind of goodness. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. No, no, you, you, you got to understand. His mama thought he was Christ incarnate. Well, she really did think she'd given birth to uh, a perfection. Well, you can't imagine the effect that had on Jediah. I think he wanted to destroy him just as sure as Cain destroyed Abel. As it was, he did the next worst thing. And what was that? Well, Jubal was in love with a girl. I, I forget her name now. They were going to be married when he finished two years of seminary school in St. Louis and then moved west to Oregon and set up a parish. Had it all planned out there, whole lives ahead of him. But Jediah? Uh, two years is a long time for a young couple to be separated. He went after his brother's girl. He stopped at nothing. He even seemed to go through a whole reform for her sake. Anyhow, she eventually yielded. But no sooner had she done that than the mask came off. He humiliated her in public and vanished, disappeared. A short time later, she discovered she was pregnant, took her own life. My God. Jubal never showed the least sign of anger. You'd think a tragedy like that's got to take its toll somewhere. But he never, never spoke a word against his brother. Even now. It's almost like he refused to admit it had happened. Whenever the subject came up, he'd look puzzled like he uh, didn't remember. I think he was the most remarkable person I'd ever met. He did become kind of withdrawn, though, and he never did go back to finish his studies. After a few months, uh, Jubal left town, too, and I never heard of either of them again until two minutes ago when you walked through that door. So he went off and found his brother and forgave him. He even took care of him. And it's had no effect on Jediah at all. A nastier person you'd never want to meet. Well, it's beyond my understanding. But, uh, what's your interest in all this? Well, I'm afraid Jediah's gone and killed a man. I'm not surprised. What was the cause? I don't know. I don't know, and I'm no closer to knowing it than I was when we found the body. But the fact is, he's escaped. I came to Laramie because I thought maybe he'd try to see his mother. And now she's dead. Anyway, he's still on the loose. We'll watch for him. Are you staying the night? Can you come to the house for dinner? Oh, thanks, but I'd better get back. Eli, you know that even now, Jubal's still defending Jediah. He covered his escape. I had to arrest him as an accessory, and he won't say a word. I don't know how two brothers can be so different, especially twins. Twins? So identical you can't tell them apart until they speak. Yet inside, as different as night and day. Jubal and Jediah weren't twins. There must have been four years between them. They didn't look at all alike. No, yeah, but they've been living together. They've been living together. Jediah was dark-complected. Jubal was blonde. There wasn't the slightest resemblance. That's impossible. Did you ever see him together? Ed? No. I never did. I don't recollect that anyone did. But they were like two different people. So Jubal was living alone, pretending to be both of them. Now, what was the purpose of that? It's like this, Mr. Peters. He didn't have a choice. What do you mean? When I got back to Commodore's Gap the next day, I confronted Jubal in his cell. Jubal? Yes? Yes, sir? Jubal, do you know why you're in jail? Uh, you say I helped my brother to escape. Did you? I, I, I don't know. Did you? I... Was he sick with scarlet fever? Were you taking care of him despite all he'd done to you? No. Are you your brother's keeper? No. Did you help him escape? No. No, I never helped him to escape. I'll never help him to escape. He's here. He's right here in this cell. He'll always be here. He'll never get away. And you can hang me for all I care. You hear me? Hang me. Because I'd just as soon kill you as look at you. So he was completely mad. But why? Why'd he take on his brother's personality? Well, I think it's what the marshal said. The pain his brother caused him had to take its toll somehow. 
if not in the soul, then in the mind. He couldn't let out the anger directly, so he took on his brother's personality. Did he realize what he was doing? No, he was completely unaware. Well, so we'll go out now and have a look at the mine. But wait a minute. You never told me who was the murdered man. Who do you think? Jediah? Returned after 15 years. Why? Only the good Lord knows. Maybe to ask his brother's forgiveness. But I doubt that. Leopards don't change their spots. From the looks of the rags he wore, I'd say it was because he was destitute. And Jubal killed him. Chased him out of the house, ran him down, and shot him in the back. The perfect son. So Jediah won after all. And that's what the death clerk meant when he said she was waiting word from God or the devil. Yes. And Jubal, what happened to him? He was made to stand trial for murder. The verdict was guilty. And the prosecutor asked for the death sentence. But the judge said no. Why? He said that Jubal had had punishment enough. What he'd done was commit the crime. They sent him to an institution for the criminally insane. And he's still there? Yep. But the last I heard, he's begun to read the Bible again. The Sears Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. Punishment and Crime was written by Percy Granger, produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Parley Bear and Howard Culver. Featured in the cast were Lynn Berman, Peggy Weber, Joe Maross, and Jack Carroll. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted